of course, your ultimate goal is to be successful and to win. It's about how you get there. And so if, you know, I, my big thing is trying to reach the potential of all these individuals, you know, not compare yourself against the next person, just how do you become the best version of you? Um, and you do your homework, you put in the time and then hopefully you put yourself in a position to, to win and be successful. And All right, I'm here with the one and only Dane Blanton for episode number two of Dane being on my podcast. Dane, thanks so much for being here. Oh, thanks for having me, Aaron. It's my pleasure. Good times. Man, this is a special edition because this is an NCAA championship edition. Dane, you're just coming off winning the NCAA championship for the USC beach volleyball team this past weekend. Uh, congratulations, man. Thanks, man. It's It's been quite a ride. Such a thrill. And uh, yeah, I haven't really had time to, to decompress. The, you know, the ball's been rolling, the train keeps moving. And uh, so really enjoying it. It's all good stuff, but real busy and just couldn't be happier for the, the girls. You know, they get in that national championship and going to get those rings and that jewelry, I like to call it. And, uh, you know, it lasts a lifetime. It's a big deal. Yeah, no, I'm 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 really proud of you. And, and uh, even though I'm a Bruin, you know, I'm really proud of your your team and school and just for having that, you know, incredible accomplishment. And for you, you know, this puts you in a, in a special category, as I was telling you before, because you're you're the only volleyball person to have an NCAA championship as a player, an Olympic gold medal, an AVP title and now an NCAA championship as a coach. How does that feel, man? Is that is that is that true? <laughs> I'm I, I'm pretty sure that's true. I mean, how does that feel? Oh man, it's you know you take one at a time, and, and fortunately, I've been able to just kind of focus on whatever time that was with volleyball because volleyball has been such a huge part of my life. And like you said, winning a national championship at Pepperdine as a player uh, way back in '92, and then winning that first AVP event in '97, and Hermosa Beach and meeting up with Eric Fanoi Moana and partnering up for the Sydney Olympics and bringing home gold was obviously the, the biggest accomplishment. And, you know, I retired around 2007, 2008 from playing and got into a lot of uh, broadcasting and public speaking and coaching. But um, to switch over to coach and to be successful is you know, it's, it's hard. It doesn't always translate, right? Uh, yeah. Good players can, can win championships, but sometimes it's difficult uh, being a coach. And so I tried to learn as much as I could. A lot of people don't realize that I, I volunteer my time for four years as a volunteer assistant at this program at USC um, under Anna Collier. And um, then I stepped away in 2019 to do more broadcasting. Uh, ESPN wanted me to do the national championships as a broadcaster. And then the job opened up. So I was so, so fortunate to get the, the job. Um, Cause so many people wanted this job, of course. Um, yeah. And so many qualified people, but you know, I, I like to think they made the right choice and um, I was able to deliver uh, relatively quickly Um because we had some great personnel and we have an amazing athletic department here at USC that really supports the, the teams and the, the head coaches and the student athlete at the end of the day, if it's good for the student athlete, then uh, Mike bone, who's our new AD as of uh, a little over a year ago is just talk about an inspired leader. If you can ever get him on here, uh, you should do it because okay knows how to rally the troops and get you fired up and it's uh it's refreshing you know it's really cool when you have the support and and the team behind the team yeah absolutely i mean i want to talk about volunteering for a second before we get into the winning part of this conversation because i was a volunteer assistant the the year in two, in 2011 for ucla under mike seeley and experience winning a championship but that year you know that was that was a tough year for me personally volunteering is a lot of people don't understand like you're volunteering your time and your energy 
and you know people are gonna remember you for what you have behind there behind you that the, the the championship there and those accolades i just described but talk about for a second volunteering i mean you for four years you know you're 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 like i said volunteering your time your energy your effort your 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 uh experience your skill sets talk about that for a second leading up to this well, you know, I love the sport and I love to try to make a difference. You know, I used to have a program called Dane's Day at the Beach where I would bring uh, kids from the YMCA and the Boys and Girls Club to the beach. And it was crazy. I'd have kids from Inglewood that maybe is, what, six, seven miles from the beach at most, um, never had been to the beach. And so exposing the sport to, to other people is always been huge for me and trying to make the sport more diverse has always been very important um but you know i became the first african american to win a, a major beach title in 97 and you know it's unfortunate that here we are in 2021 and there hasn't been another male on the pro circuit that ha has been successful so you know it's been that situation where you want to help, you want to give back. And I got a phone call in 2015 and Anna Collier called me and she said, Hey, I need you to, to fill in. Misty May was actually her assistant volunteer assistant at the time. And I believe she got pregnant and was going to walk away. Um, so she went from, you know, Anna was good at going out. She had one gold medalist and then she brought, brought me in and, um, I was skeptical at the time, but then I came and met the team and Sarah Hughes was leading the team at the time and Kelly Clayson, they were so cool and so professional and so fired up and inspired and playing with passion that I was like, all right, let me give this a shot. We ended up going 28-0 that year, winning the national championship. The last year it was an AVCA sponsored sport and then really focused in on 2016. That's the first year of the NCAA sanctioned beach volleyball and won that one and then came back in 2017 and made it a back to back to back by winning uh, the first two national championships and that was with that class of Sarah Hughes um Kelly Clay's Alex Alexa Strange uh Sophie Bukovic Nick Martin Ali Wheeler and like Joe Kramer Jenna Belton like that same class went through so they won three national championships and then I stayed 2018. We got fourth. That was the first. That was, I think, the only year we have not been in the the finals. And I think that is the case. I'm not sure. But, uh, I loved it. I was doing it because I I loved it, and I it was fun. We were playing good volleyball. The kids were so excited to learn, and you know, at the time, I was not, I wasn't doing it trying to set myself up or anything I was trying to learn and if I loved it and learned enough maybe I get a job somewhere but when I walked away in 2019 because I figured four years right it's enough as a volunteer assistant uh, that if I could get one job in college beach volleyball that the USC Trojan job is the best job out there yeah. uh, and that's you know location for me takes me about 12 minutes to get into work as a volunteer I learned that hey this place is so cool that it's 12 minutes away from my house you know I can drive in the support from the, the athletic department is unreal and the facilities are amazing and you know I can walk out of my office throw a ball across the street I'd hit the court so we're that close and the three courts we have here in our arena Merle, Merle Norman Stadium is the name of it and it's just, it's great. I thought this was the coolest place. So when Anna Collier ended up retiring, I was like, I got to get in on that, you know, and put my name in the hat. And fortunately, things went my way. Um, they took a chance on me. I had not been a head coach. And I know, I think at the time they were looking for that. So I couldn't change that, right? I hadn't been the head coach. So they, uh, they took, you know, I guess a little bit of a risk, you know, um, but uh, it's so nice to have been able to to win to to win already, and uh, and the group of girls that that we have just did everything they could do, and and we're in the end just really playing so hard for one another. It was really ins inspiring to watch. Yeah, 
Yeah. Well, I'm inspired by, by your, uh, your resume and what you're, what you've been able to do, you know, and even winning as a volunteer, you know, I got to add that to your resume too. <laughs> um, but I want to get into, you know, this past weekend, cause we're, we're fresh off a, a championship here. So Dane, how does it feel to win an NCAA championship, especially after the pandemic? Oh man. Do we get lucky, right? In terms of just completing the year, there's so many obstacles and the, the, we ask so much of the, the players, you know, you got to test two and three times a week. You got to have screening to come in every day. You go through these checks and temperature checks and you're trying to do the right thing. And so many people doing the right thing still were getting COVID, you know, so I can't, uh, emphasize enough how I was so thankful Friday night at the national championships was the last time that we tested. And, um, you know, you just hope that no athlete on your team or another team gets COVID and then their team might be ineligible to play. And right you now it just would put a damper on the whole situation. Right. right. Uh, you know, imagine if we were eliminated on Friday after waiting, you know, being in the winner's bracket, all of a sudden the whole team's out. Or if UCLA, they lost it. And so, it, you know, it wouldn't be as sweet if people, if the whole field wasn't there. And so right. that, that was cool that everybody stayed, stayed clean and we made it through. And I think, I think the best two teams in the country ended up playing one another. And, you know, it was – you couldn't draw it up any better. It, you know, it was a smooth trip. We went out there early. We got acclimated. And you can always face little bumps in the road. But for the most part, we had a really great, great experience and a great trip and a pretty seamless uh, trip. So um, that's important. And it's hard to orchestrate. And sometimes there's things out of your hand. But um, me and my staff was we put it together and we had all the right pe people in place and they all did their job. And that's the only way, you know, you win with that full team effort. Absolutely. Um, well, you mentioned staff, um, you know, what were some of the keys to your team's success? If you want to talk about your staff a little bit, that'd be great. Yeah. Well, the first assistant is Gustavo, um, Hocha. He's Brazilian. He's amazing. He's got his finger on the pulse of basically everything, um, from not only recruiting, but, you know, the latest techniques and drills and whatnot. And we just get, get along so well. It's so funny. I remember us talking about if one day we could coach together at a, you know, and run a program together when he was an assistant, because he was, he was a full-time assistant when I was a volunteer assistant in 2018. So we had that overlap. And so to come back and work with him and it's just, we have such a, we have such a good time, uh, doing all the things that we do. And then, so he does a, a tremendous job and we couldn't have won without him and his expertise. And then we also brought in Laurel Weaver, who's a former player. She played uh, first at UCLA, then was at Hawaii. I think she, yeah, she finished up at Hawaii and very passionate and so focused. And I think she was a great addition to the squad because of how current and recent she's been, she was playing against some of the players, you know, and I, I think they had to adjust to that. Like, Hey, we played against this, this player a few years ago. Cause she's uh, I think 25, you know, she's just a few years out. So the three of us really, that was the main core of the coaching staff. Um, that's all you can really have in beach. One day, I think they'll, hopefully have two full-time assistants and, and a volunteer because we have five courts to cover, but um, we get help from sports psychology, from nutrition, from strength and conditioning, from athletic medicine. And we have people in all those areas helping cover everything. Yeah, no, it's, it's uh, it's an all-star staff for sure. Um, for people who might not understand how the NCAA championships work, I was wondering if you could maybe explain your coaching process through that tournament. Um, from my understanding, there's five pairings and the winner is the best team to get uh, or the team to get three wins. Um, you know, what are the main responsibilities for the head coach and the staff during this tournament? And, and if you could kind of carry that over to your, your, your personal self-talk during the tournament. 
Yeah, I mean, it's a lot, right? Because you don't have a big staff. And so you got to be responsible for deadlines, practice times, um, and just making sure you're a few days ahead of the game, right? Because the day of things start moving really quickly. But um, you're absolutely right. It's five pairs play. Whoever gets to three, three out of five wins in the the great thing about the national championship is you play to a decision. You don't play to completion, which means as soon as someone wins three, there's a like a bullhorn that goes off that the match is over. So the other two matches could be mid-match and they don't get finished because wow. it makes perfect sense because you're not going to play for f- just for the heck of it if you have an important match in the afternoon. Like if the if the duel's over, there's no point of continuing in a playoff situation. We, we run the Pac-12 tournament the same way. Um, so you're, it's a race. The interesting thing is the first couple of rounds are five courts going simultaneously. The second day, um, they change it up to where they'll start two matches and then 15 minutes later, they'll start the other three. So there's a slight, slight stagger. Once you get to Sunday, it is two flights. So you'll have like the two and fours will play all the way to completion. And once those mat two dual, those two matches are completed, then the other three matches start simultaneously. So the great thing about that is no one can win in the first flight, right? You could be up 2-0 or it's going to be one all. That's going to provide for some drama, obviously. If you're down 0-2 and you need to win the, the next three, that's a lot of pressure. We ended up splitting with UCLA in those first two. And so we needed whoever was going to win two out of those next three in that flight. Uh, but it, it provides for some really good drama and uh, some amazing television and ESPN did a fantastic job with covering, uh, you know, five courts, but um, as a coach, you're running around. I enjoy the flights, right? Because there's only three matches that can be going on at one time. Therefore every court is covered. When you have five matches going on at the same time, you have to make decisions as a head coach, whose court are you going to stay on? Who, are you going to leave? Who do you think's maybe mature enough to handle it? Who needs a little more help? Like all these things are taken into consideration because you can only be in one place, uh, you know, at one time you want to replicate yourself in those situations. So you can put a coach on every court, but you can't do it. You only got three and there's five teams. So I, I, I think we'll have a big push to get that second assistant over the next, next year. Hopefully I, uh, I will be on the NCA committee starting in about six months uh, for beach volleyball. And so hopefully we can make some improvements to the sport in that regard. Cool. And, and how about the pairings, you know? Um, and my question about the pairings is I'm assuming that you, the head coach creates the pairings, but can you shift pairings from tournament to tournament? For example, the PAC 12 where UCLA won it, did you shift your pairings to have a different pairing matchup in the, in the NCAAs? Yeah, great question. Um, the way it usually works and try to follow if you can in the regular season, you put your pairings out there, right? You, Someone's at the one, two, three, four. Once you start someone in the lineup of those top five positions, they are kind of locked in, right? So they are a, a permanent, they're like a player. They're not a reserve anymore. Someone who hasn't played is considered a reserve. So say I start you, Aaron, at the number two spot. You play at the twos. Uh, you play great. I want to move you up. I can move you up one spot or down one spot for the next duel. No more than that, right? So if you're at a two, I cannot take you down to four. You See, can either okay. or one or stay the same. You can't move more than one spot. So if I want to get you, if I'm like, oh, wow, I started the season and I thought Aaron was a two and I need to get you down to five, right? Like it's going to take me three, three duels to get you there. Does that make sense? Um, yeah. And so that being the case, you can switch every time. If you're in a tournament, like prior to the Pac-12 championship, you have to submit a lineup 
and that is your lineup for the tournament. So you can't game it to to match up against one opponent. You know, you have to play that all the way through. So we did the Pac-12s, then there's an opportunity to change your lineup for the national championship. And there's a submission process. There's actually a window where you can challenge other teams lineups as well and say, Hey, that's, we don't think that's accurate. I think you have, you know, the player you have at five should be a two, you know, like what, what are we doing here? And usually you have a track record of the season when you get to the national championships. Um, I don't believe there's any challenges this year. Um, I know we weren't involved in any, but in years prior, I, I had seen some challenges, um, you know, and, and like, let's give an example, like Sarah Hughes, right. was always a great player. She was a one. Like if you, if you try to slide her to two, there'd be a problem with that. Got yeah. it. Yeah. Someone would say, Hey, she's always been at one. Why, you know, there, there would be a discussion about it mm-hmm. and protocol, which is great because you want to get a fair lineup, you know, you want to get your one through five, like you want your ones at one. If you are putting your best players at two and three, it's kind of disingenuous and uh, other coaches are able to call it, call it out. So we kept it pretty consistent. Um, we did have a lineup change mid mid season and I think um, a few teams changed up their lineup to kind of hone in on what it was. And, but if it's not anything crazy, then usually it's not going to get challenged. But if it's like, Hey, that's your best player and you got them at three, like we need to have discussion. So that's kind of how it works. I hope that makes sense. But um, those postseason tournaments are important because when you lock the lineup, locked for the tournament you can't whereas during the season you can jump from duel to duel no i I really appreciate that breakdown uh that's helpful because um a lot of people including myself we don't understand you know a lot i wasn't aware of that so that's it's cool to uh to hear that side of the coaching part of this um i want to ask you about pressure did you and your team feel pressured to win and and like carry that on to expectations like how do you manage expectations in a tournament like this Well, I think I always put pressure on myself. I think that's how I've been able to accomplish things. You you put yourself in, you know, what people say is pressure is a privilege. You've probably heard that. Yeah. Position to where there is pressure and there are nerves and there are, there is adrenaline and there are expectations, but the big, you know, the thing I focus on is the process more than, Hey, I, I need to win. I need to win. Like, what does that mean? And where does that get you? It doesn't get you anywhere other than making you more nervous. So when I say that the process, you fall back on your training, like, Oh, I'm not passing well. Okay. So I need to do X, Y, and Z to pass. Well, uh, what's my next play? Am I focused on the next play and my present? Um, and I, am I looking at the scoreboard all day or am I thinking of what am I going to do the next play? You know, because looking at the scoreboard, thinking about the outcome, I believe is somewhat of a dead end. Uh, right. Philosophy. And, but a lot of coaches are like that. Hey, we got to win. And here's our goal. And we got to win, win, win. And you're like, oh, what does that mean? <laughs> you know, you just. But of course, your ultimate goal is to be successful and to win. It's about how you get there. And so if, you know, I, my big thing is trying to reach the potential of all these individuals, you know, not compare yourself against the next person, just how do you become the best version of you? Um, and you do your homework, you put in the time and then hopefully you put yourself in a position to, to win and be successful. And that's what we did all year. And so did we, have expectations to win? Absolutely. Um, were there pressures to win? Sure. I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, you can talk around it all day, but you're playing to, to win a title and to get better and to win the right way and with class and character. And hopefully with these individuals, they'll go on not only to represent USC, USC, in a positive light, but 
they'll have the tools, you know what I mean, to navigate the real world because you want someone to get out of here with a great degree um, to be mature and and represent well. And the, the, the frosting on the cake is to have uh, a national championship and, and to get that jewelry because, you know, that's going to that last a lifetime. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's stay on winning for a little bit more because, uh, you know, winning is a, it's, it's kind of a choice. It's a mindset, you know? Um, and like you said, like, you, you know, it's, it's a, it takes a focus, right. That uh, only winners really have that focus. I feel like, and, and I just want to hear a little bit more about winning as a team, as a program, um, you know, winning is all about coming together at the right time. You know, how do you facilitate a culture during the tournament to allow everyone to buy into that? Well, it starts with every day, the simple things at practice, like how, you know, are you bringing effort? Are you bringing enthusiasm? Are you bringing the right attitude to practice? Are you, you know, are you competing? Why are you competing? Are you competing for yourself? Are you competing for your partner? Um, all those things I try to interject into our culture of, you know, this is a family. Um, we got your back. Are you sacrificing what you need to? Because, you know, at the end of the day, Aaron, you know, everybody, I'll tell you, they want to win. Right. But like, once you figure out what the costs are of winning, that's when you truly figure out if someone is dedicated enough to pay the price to win and at the end of the day that's the only thing that matters everyone wants to win you know but are you going to pay the price and some don't figure out what the cost is so my my vision is to present that cost here's the cost this is what it's going to cost you as an athlete like you're already here you're a student athlete it's going to be tough doing school and playing four hours a day, you know, like strength and conditioning practice, it all adds up. And what are those costs? And then why are you playing? Are you, you know, what's the bond to your person to your right and left? Because if you have a bunch of individuals out there, it's usually not going to work. You got to bring them together and, and they can't just be, you know, playing because as a coach and a player, you walk that fine line of, because you, you're not on the court. You don't get to do it. So you, you got to be careful that you're not out there like tense and want it more than the athlete. The athlete has to drive the bus. You know, once you give them the tools, it's got to be their team, you know. And you want – the dream for a coach is having a player who is an extension of the coach and has that, that basically philosophy, that extension. And I think that's what like – like a Phil Jackson had, right? Not only with Jordan, but then with Kobe, right? You just saw him able to take a step back, manage personalities because he had so much talent. Um, but once the team is functioning independently of the coaches in a sense, like, you know, the work is done on game day. They know exactly the routine to and what they need to do and get to get out there. And that's all the coach can ask for is that when you get down to that championship, that they know why they're playing, they have bonded, they respect one another, they respect the process and they're just pumped and ready to go. And I think we achieved that level that the players made a decision that they, they were not going to be denied. And, um, you could, you could just see it in the eyes. If you go back and watch the tapes, they were pretty, uh, they expected to win and, but not in an arrogant way, in a way that I know I've done my homework. I know I'm prepared. I am ready for this moment. And I have to believe in that, you know, it's, you know, it's similar to like, I remember hearing Tiger Woods interviewed at one point, he said, I expect to win every tournament that I enter. And, you know, some people might be off put by that, by like, what do you mean? Like, you can't win every tournament, but like, you have to believe that you can, or you're not doing it. It's like when I, when I played in the Olympics, when Eric and I played, I expected to win. I had high expectations of myself. I believed I could win and 
you may, you know, you may be fooling yourself, but it doesn't matter. You know, it doesn't matter. But if you listen to the naysayers and the noise, and that's another thing, you want to quiet the noise. And I think we got to a point to where we quieted the noise because there's always noise. There's always distraction. There's always haters. There's always, and if you listen to it, you just, you know, there's, and those people that are usually making the noise are sitting at home. They're not on the court, you know, and behind their computer screen or whatever. So as soon as you can put all that in perspective, which it's a lot, right. But you got to believe that you can like run through walls. Right. And then you just let the cards fall. And, you know, the best thing is walking off the court and saying, you know what, I laid it all on the line and only you can look in the mirror at the end of the day and say, cause I can, as a coach say, Hey, did you play hundred percent? And you're like, yeah, coach. And you're like, whatever. Right. Like you go home and you're like, gosh, I, I could have played harder or, damn, I put everything on the line. I could barely walk out of there. And I was so mentally exhausted because I was so focused. You know, but only you know as a player. And when that's between you and you. And so sometimes, you know, players have to have, I, I like to say players have to have meetings with themselves mm-hmm. to figure out, uh, and question, you know, are am I paying the price? Am I working hard enough? Do I really deserve it? And then if you, those answers are yes, then it's very empowering. But um, yeah, it's a fun culture that I'm putting together. And, you know, sometimes it makes weird twists and turns. But for the most part, you want players leaving it on the court, the efforts through the roof, the respects there. I want people to come on the court, beat each other up and then walk off and they can, you know, be friends and teammates or not sometimes you get some heated battles within the team but you're making each other better yeah i mean making each other better is what it's all about and i just want you to build on that because a lot of people talk about winning you're either winning or you're learning i'm sure you've heard that before but i don't know i I think i would kind of challenge that i think you're always learning even when you're winning you're learning and to me you know winning my my uh my opinion is that you know winning also takes a commitment to your own personal growth so how did you personally grow through this run and and your include your staff and your players on that too i think the biggest thing is the validation right like you never know like of course everyone looked at me and they're like oh he's a new coach right so he hasn't figured it out or you need that experience and you're, you know, that's true. You, you need experience and whatnot, but when you come in with a philosophy and you come in with a uh, focus on the culture and you have the talent and it works, that's validating, right? You're like, sure, I could get better and I will get better. Sure, I could tweak this and that, but guess what? The way I did it, worked right like that's undeniable right and and it worked you could sit back and critique it all day and i could make it work way better or but that's cool and it gives you confidence it's almost like you go and play a game right and you're and you beat someone you're like wow i didn't know you know i could beat now i know um and that gives you confidence and I believe that the more confidence you get, the more kind of competent in your processes as well. And you start believing in it, but there's nothing more than earning and when, you know, proving concept, right. And, and it working, not to say it's perfect and not to say there's not a ton to learn, but it, it's really refreshing to f- to know that we were doing some of the right things. And I'll, you know, when we start to flip the page and focus on next year, I'll go in with a beginner's mind of, hey, I still got a lot to learn. And hopefully every year I'll have more to learn and more to learn. Um, Because I I think this is just the beginning. 
Yeah, I love that mindset. Um, I want to I want to talk about inspired leadership. You know that I'm I'm uh, really interested in this topic, and I love talking to inspired leaders like yourself. Um, how does inspired leadership, the idea of inspired leadership in coaching, translate to inspired play? Well, I think coaches are such important mentors, right? So you got to have the enthusiasm. I always I, I really focus on you know a lot on attitude. Uh, and effort and enthusiasm and you got to bring that fire every day if you as a coach you're walking in and, uh, you know this is another day and you're grinding like what do you think the players are going to do right they're, they're, oh, man, like, this is boring you know but if you bring in fire you can do the same thing every day but if you bring the right attitude let's go let's get going here are we going to get better you know you're going to have a better environment you want an environment that kids are like can't wait to get to practice go to practice you don't want the environment like oh man, i gotta go to practice again and i have some gym rats on my team that just they want to be there the first ones there and they're asking to do drills as we leave you know we're limited to 20 hour weeks at the college level so that includes strength and conditioning so all our time is logged and uh you know you have to be in compliance so you can't over train i can't be like hey we're staying for five hours today like uh, four hour max per day and 20 hour weeks. And so it's, you got to maximize that time. So you better bring fire, you better bring enthusiasm. But I think the coach is a mentor. And I think the kind of personality of the team will reflect coaching. Um, you know, in unique cases, sometimes you, you have such a divide that the players bond because of the coaching staff, like they're almost uh, like almost like an uprising, like we're going to just do our own thing. Uh, but that's that wouldn't be a healthy environment. But I've seen that observing some other situations. Um, you want everybody on the same page, everybody playing for one another, everybody respecting one another, everybody respecting the game and the work ethic and um, understanding at the end of the day, it doesn't matter on paper how good you are or how talented your team is. You got to go prove it. And I think that's a, that was a cool thing that the team did. I thought we were extremely talented. I think I had some crazy athletes, but it doesn't matter. You could lose to much lesser athletes that are bonded and are playing really high quality volleyball. And, uh, and there's so many great teams too. If you think about that, like we haven't talked about that and great coaches, you know, I thought, I thought John Mayer did a fantastic job at LMU this year. And he's, his team's always prepared and ready to go. Uh, you, you know, you can't say enough about UCLA and uh, Stein Metzger and, and Jenny Johnson, Jordan. Uh, and Jose Loyola too. And Sean Fallowfield. Yeah. I mean, yeah, they've had some great volunteer assistance, but those two have stayed pretty solid. Um, Stein and Jenny, and they're always well coached. They're always ready to go. They're always scrappy. And it's cool. Like I always like playing the best, right? Like on the beach, I love playing cards because I thought it brought the best out of you. And I love competing this whole crosstown rivalry, you know, with USC and UCLA. It's great to be a part of that. Um, but, you know, there's respect there as well. Like me and Stein have been competing since I was at Pepperdine and was at UCLA. And we were on the same Olympic team in 2004 on different pairs, but we're at the same thing. And Jenny Johnson, she was on the Olympic team when I was there in 2000. And so it's a small community, but um, there's so many great teams and, and coaches and personnel. And it's so fun to see it growing. Uh, but the format is fascinating. It's that I think it's, it can be more compelling than just bracket play. Um, where you're dancing, just the pairs, it, it means so much. And the cool thing is the five pair is just as important as the one pair. And I always tell the kids, like, listen, you win a national championship, no one's going to ask you where you played. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not like, oh, you played at the four. Oh, so it's not that important. <laughs> or you played it, you know, because everyone wants to play higher and play the best. But we have a pretty deep team. So sometimes you have players that could be playing at two or three on one program 
that might be at four or five because there's a lot of great athletes here. Um, but the whole thing is so fun. I just hope we can keep growing it and that we can have, you know, a few hundred teams and keep the funding going and maybe get to the point where we have a two assistant coaches instead of one. And I think the sky's the limit for it. It's just so fun. And I've been so fortunate with beach volleyball or volleyball in general, because I've been able to be a part of it in so many different facets, you know, being a player, being a broadcaster, being a coach. Yeah. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's a blast, you know, I'm really so happy we're able to pull this off in this challenging time and uh hats off to the girls you know they did it i just I tried to orchestrate it right well just a couple more things dane and i want to respect your time but i, I want to stay on this idea of inspired leadership and empowerment for a second because you i know we discussed it a little bit but i want this to be relatable to any coach of a youth team whether it's uh, volleyball or any other sport or any other coaches out there you know how do you like how does facilitating an environment of empowerment translate to creating players who are not just inspired but inspired leaders? Because you mentioned before that you want your players to be extensions of the coach out there, right? I think all coaches want that. But when you when you set it up as an, as a as, and you and you facilitate this environment of empowerment, just talk about that for a second. Well, because a lot of coaches are really hands on, right? So they're they're almost micromanaging their players yeah. it's like parenting you know i'm a new parent i have a three-year-old you can help that parent do everything i mean i'm sorry that child do everything but you're not helping you know like picking up going and picking up their clothes and feeding them and like putting the food in their mouth like you got to learn they have to learn how to do it so same with a player i could tell a player all day and but until they get it until you empower them like hey this is your show hey you're in control here you have a say here you can make a difference here i mean and sometimes it's little things like hey you know what what uniforms you guys want to wear today oh hey uh you want to do this you want to do this drill today or oh what do you want to do what time you guys want to go to the airport tomorrow like when they start to understand like oh, I'm not being told to do everything. Like I am empowered. Like that's where that leadership on my end, I give them the keys to, hey, you can make some of the decisions. This is, you're part of this deal. Because when you're told what to do and when everything's done for you, you're like, whatever. But when you have to make decisions, you feel like, hey, this is my deal. I am controlling this. I am, you know, an agent of change for my environment. And once that clicks, it's kind of a whole different ball game. Like, Hey, I, I own this. Like, and I I'm, it's more important to me because I'm not just listening to commands. I'm actually making the decisions. And so I think that's the biggest thing to not only inspire your players or inspire whoever is looking up to you, but that also makes them leaders by default because mm. they're, they're making decisions. So that's kind of how I see it. Um, so as, mu as much as I can, I, I try to allow the players to have input, to make decisions. There's times when I have to put my foot down and, tell them like maybe it's a lineup thing or something like just trust me this is the way we need to be going um and it's fun it's fun to have those kind of conversations like evolved conversations so it's not always hey i'm the teacher you're the student it's like let's have a a, a talk and and treat people as adults you know because that's what these kids are turning into this is such a cool window that eight, 17, 18 to 23 range is, I mean, imagine the growth when you look back at, at your years, those are our big years, right? It's, it's not like, like, you know, you take it for granted when you get older, you're like, yeah, 33 to 36. Yeah. Not much movement, right? 
but like those years going from a teenager to an adult are huge. And so hopefully I can in, inspire more of those student student athletes to be leaders and to take some of the the uh, the wisdom and knowledge that I've learned and translate it into and integrate it into their life. And uh, they're not all going to be inspired leaders, as, as you like to say, but, you know, you change one or two and it's all worth it. And so hopefully you can do more than that, but, you know, not everybody's going to like your system and, and, but you got to be okay with that. Yeah. Wow. Well said. Um, a last point on this inspired leadership idea, you know, I actually reached out to Holly McPeak, um, wanted to, wanted to get a little insight from her because she watched the whole tournament and she knows you well. And, um, she, she said he was very calm and thought his, and, and I thought his team came together at the right time. It was paired two and three that were diff the difference for me. And I just want to talk about, about that calm demeanor because I've always noticed that in you and, you know, I, I think that's one of the number one characteristics or qualities of an inspired leader. Um, and just, can you just talk about where that comes from and how you sustain that? Even yeah, You must get upset and get fired up too. I just don't see that, <laughs> you know? You get upset. I mean, we're all competing and that's the fun part. And you, you, you know, you know, you're going to win some, you're going to lose some, like losing the Pac-12, that was tough. Um but I think it benefited us in the end. Um, but I, I would say I have a pretty mellow kind of uh, laid back demeanor. Um, but like being under Coach Marv Dunphy uh, at Pepperdine, I learned a tremendous amount and still meet with him and still learning. Uh, but you know what? I, I think back to the, my career playing for him and I don't even recall him ever yelling, never going off <laughs> But you, you knew, though, you knew when he was upset and you didn't want to disappoint him. So you would play for, him. you know, you played for him. He he had that magic where not only were you playing for your teammates and yourself, but you were also playing for him. You know, you didn't want to disappoint. And uh, I think his he always says, you know, get rid of the peaks and valleys, right? Because there's always going to be the peaks and the valleys and you don't want the graph to be too much like that. You want the graph to be a little more steady and getting better. Um, and he always had a quote, he would say, you're getting better, you're getting worse. And it's like, there's no in between. And but he went about it in a way that was always composed, right? I don't think that the players respond or not all players respond well to a lot of roller coaster ups and downs from their coach. You know, uh, if you can be that steadying, steadying force and that sign of consistency for the players, I think that's calming for them. Of course, they're going to go on roller coaster rides of their, of their own, but um, you want to be that, that anchor for them that, Hey, this is steady win or lose. You know, it's not the end of the world. We're getting better. We're working hard. We're learning from situations and, you know, we're playing the numbers. We want to put ourselves in the best possible position to succeed. And uh, that's what it's all about. Yes. Yes. Um, you mentioned the evolution of the game. What does this win do for the whole sport moving forward? Um, well, I think it was a, a huge win for beach volleyball, like to have it this year amongst right. all the challenges. But I think every year the sport is gaining momentum. The CIF has certified, I, I believe, the sport at the high school level. Um, it's only going to grow. A lot of a lot of players are making distinct decisions at an earlier age if they're going to play beach or indoor. It's not like you have to play um, both, and because I think a lot, I think a lot of kids are burning out. And I know a lot of kids are going to beach practice and going straight to indoor practice and you can only do so much. So I think that there's more players playing and I think there's more players at the high school level that are going to funnel right into the collegiate level. And then I think women's beach volleyball in the United States is going to be in a very good place when you start seeing some of these athletes that some of these 
coaches are producing, you know, like, like we mentioned, some of the coaches, you know, Brooke Niles, Stein Metzger, uh, uh, Russell Brock over at LSU. Um, they're getting good coaching. They're getting a good foundation. And so that's going to translate. That was a big thing for me is going to college and playing for Marv, even though it was on an indoor level, I learned, I tried to learn how to win and his philosophy because he was coming back from winning the 88 Olympics as the head coach of the indoor team. So it's almost like I learned on the indoor game from a coach and have translated that, you know, to the beach game uh, because mental toughness is mental toughness. It doesn't matter the environment, but uh, the sport's in a great place and there's schools picking up the sport constantly and like I said, it'd be awesome if we ever got to the point, like to have the same or close to number of like indoor schools, because indoor women's volleyball at the collegiate level is a big deal. And there's over 300 D1 schools. And so it'd be awesome to get to that level one day. Um, but it's moving the needle. I think that ESPN put on a crazy show. And I think the distribution of being on ESPN is massive because any sports fan flicks the channels and they get to see it. So I think we probably gained a lot of new fans. And I think it being UCLA, USC rivalry doesn't hurt it, um, but it'll grow, you know, it, it'll keep growing and other teams are going to be knocking at the door. And I think in a few years, the Gulf Shores is hosted forever, but I think they're going to move it to Southern California in like 2025. So they'll start moving the national championship around and that'll give different exposure. But um, it's in good hands right now. And, and I think everybody's moving it in the right direction to make it as successful as possible. Yeah, great. Dane, thank you so much for coming on today and, and sharing some of this experience that you had. And congratulations for winning the title and um, I'm just really proud of you, you know, as a as a, a coach, as a friend, as a mentor, you know, you you're a class act, man. I really appreciate you. Oh, thanks, Aaron. I, I love being on your show. I'll do it anytime. Uh, and uh, hopefully we can keep making a difference and uh, creating those those next inspired leaders. But um, I think it starts with the youth and it's cool to to be able to interact with with some of these student athletes that go on to do some great things. So you're doing some good work yourself and uh, let's continue to, to move the needle. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much and um, appreciate you coming on today and we'll talk soon. All right. Appreciate it. Thanks, Dane. This episode is brought to you by DAF Global. If you're looking to start a podcast or you have a podcast and you're looking for editing services, hit up my guys, Oliver and Garrett at DAF Global. They're awesome. They help me with this podcast and they take care of all kinds of different services like editing and audio enhancement. And they're great to work with. They're also offering a 10% discount to all within the game listeners. So hit my guys up at DAF Global on Instagram and also on their website, www.dafglobal.co.uk.